Good. Yeah, sure, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. Um, I'm, I'm going to be talking about vigilantism, what it is, and uh, things that are relevant to it. Then I'm going to go through a couple of cases. Um, some of these cases come from uh, the, the book by Ronson, So You've Been Publicly Shamed, which maybe some of you people know. Very good book. And uh, then I'm going to be uh, uh, talking about um, uh, uh, vigilantism in the, uh, uh, in the light of, of all of that. So clearly, vigilantism is a sort of play on words. It's a kind of uh, related to vigilantism. If we think vigilantism is wrong, we might think that vigilantism is wrong. And uh, we just have to see whether those kinds of things uh, transfer over. So here's what I mean by vigilantism. I mean punishing public exposure of wrongdoing to a usually selected audience. It could be people who you think are like-minded with you. Um, the status of the action as wrongdoing is sometimes disputed. We'll come to a case of that immediately. Um, the addressed online audience reacts with hate speech and threats of injury to this uh, uh, wrongdoing, and usually a reaction from untargeted online audiences as well. So in addition to the people you're addressing, whom you want to, to, to get outraged, there are other people who, who chime in as well. And the wrongdoing can be subcriminal. That's to say, not illegal quite or hard to prosecute and the reaction bypasses law enforcement agencies, they might not get involved if you brought it to their attention. So here are the dimensions of vigilantism that I'm going to be looking at. I should tell you that I'm a philosopher, uh, as academically trained <coughs> as a philosopher, and so I'll be doing it as a philosopher might, as a moral philosopher might. Um, in moral philosophy, what we're trying to do is to come up with reasons for thinking that things are right or wrong based on theories that are very systematic about right and wrong. So it's not empirical, it's normative, but it's rigorous. Okay, here are the, dim the dimensions of vigilantism. <coughs> One of the dimensions when we talk about whether it's right or wrong is the seriousness of the wrongdoing exposed. So it depends if something's very serious uh, wrongdoing, maybe it should be exposed. If it's less serious, maybe it's more optional. Then another dimension is the severity of hate speech that's in response to the wrongdoing. Um, whether there's the occurrence of physical attack in addition to hate speech, whether there's reputational damage and how long the reputational damage is going to last, and then the dependence of the target of the vigilantism on the uh, social media world. You'll see that's, that's relevant. And then there's the effects on the rule of law. So uh, the first case I'm going to take up, which I think many people are familiar with, is the Patty Levine woman. Uh, on YouTube, if you find this, um, there, there's a, a, a YouTube uh, a film of, of a woman who's walking along um, a street. Um, she notices a cat who's, who's walking uh, on, on a ledge uh, over a pavement, takes the cat and puts it in a bin and walks away. Before she puts the cat in the bin, she looks around. Uh, when she's satisfied, apparently, that nobody's looking, she puts it in the bin and, um, and walks away. So um, what happened was that the cat was in the bin for 15 hours. And then the video of this occurrence was posted uh, to identify the culprit. So the culprit was identified. Um, this happened in Coventry, I think. Um, the culprit was identified, um, and she was prosecuted. She was, uh, she was fined 250 pounds, ordered to pay legal costs, and was prevented from owning animals for five years. But not only was she prosecuted, but she suffered enormous online abuse and death threats. Um, Here's some other things that are important uh, in this case. Um, the wrongdoing was uncharacteristic, but of course the people who posted it didn't know that. Uh, the harm was doubted by the wrongdoer. She didn't really see what harm it did to the cat. Um, uh, the public shaming led to online abuse and death threats, uh, which we've covered, and the prosecution followed online vil vilification. So because prosecution followed the vilification, wasn't vigilantism, uh, plain and simple. And then the wrongdoer was protected at home by the police. Now these are all uh, dimensions that would register in a moral theory as having to be given weight. And then the question is, can we come up with something systematic based on all of the cases I'm going to be looking at? And these are just a bit of from the spectrum. Um, here's the Justine Sacco case. Does everybody know this case? Um, this is the case of a publicist who, um, who had a sort of indiscreet 
Twitter feed. Um, this is a sample from her Twitter feed. She's uh, tw tweeting about a German man on the plane with her um, in first class. Uh, she, twit she tweets, we're a German dude. We're in first class. It's 2014. Get some deodorant. Inner monologue as I inhale DO. Thank God for pharmaceuticals. And then she's on a plane. She's going from New York to Heathrow. She stops in Heathrow. Then she says, hey, chili cucumber sandwiches, bad seat. Back in London. And then, uh, when she was flying, uh, when she was about to go to um, Heathrow to South Africa, she said, going to Africa, hope I don't get AIDS, just kidding, I'm white. So she turned her phone off, and she was flying to South Africa. When she got to South Africa and turned her phone on, she found that these tweets had gone viral, and that she was a world object of uh, hate. <laughs> Whoops. I've turned it off. <laughs> Cripes. I've turned it off. It was too much for me. Here we go. So here's what happened to her. She was sacked from her PR dream job. She was vilified on social media, and she was out of work for a long time, which drove her into depression. And um, here's some important uh, features of this case. Um, she was confident as a very routine tweeter that the tone in which she was delivering all of this stuff would be understood and that nobody would take it seriously. Um, uh, that, you might think, is PR naivete from a PR woman. Um, and of course, what made it offensive, I, I go into this in the way that philosophers do, just to make it all explicit. Disadvantaged group is a source of humor, probably doubly, triply disadvantaged group is a source of humor. Snowballing offense and notoriety offense and notoriety as a liability not only to individuals but employers. So <clears throat> one reason she was sacked from her PR job is that people thought it was outrageous that she was allowed to keep a job as a publisher with these, this kind of, of, of Twitter feed. Okay. Now I'm going to give you the, thir the third case and we'll go on to sort of the morals a bit. I don't know whether you've heard of this case. This is also in Ronson. Uh, a book. I'll just go through this um, quickly. You can read along with me. Um, on 17 March 2013, Hank was in the audience at a conference for tech developers in Santa Clara when a stupid joke popped into his head, which he murmured to his friend Alex. What was the joke? It was so bad I don't remember the exact words. It was about a fictitious piece of hardware that has a really big dongle, a ridiculous dongle. We were giggling about that. You can tell these guys are into this. Attention. Here we go. Um, now, somebody was, was uh, overhearing this conversation in front of them. Her name is Adria, and she posted some pictures of these guys who had made the joke. And here's uh, her explaining herself in the Because You're a Girl blog. She says, yesterday I publicly called out a group of guys at the PyCon conference who were not being respect respectful to the community. Accountability was important. These guys sitting right behind me felt safe in the crowd. I got that and realized that being anonymous was fueling their behavior. Uh, this, I stood up slowly, turned around, and took three clear photos. So here's the aftermath for Hank, the guy who made the joke. He lost his job, which was the main source of support for his wife and three children. He posted an apology on Hacker News and named Adria as the person whose actions had led to his dismissal. So then there was an aftermath for Adria. She was targeted for online abuse by men's rights groups supporting Hank. And she was attacked by 4chan trollers, the famous 4chan uh, site, uh, advocating that she be killed, raped, and tortured. And then there was a denial of a service attack on Adria's employer, SendGrid. And so Adria lost her job. And here are some important features of this case. Um, an advantaged group, white men, is the intended target of original post. Gang solidarity, uh, punishing exposure in the name of a group the punisher belongs to. In this case, a sort of broadly feminist group uh, uh, that read a certain blog. The expectation of support. Um, the support for punishing exposure from like-minded appropriators of the cause. Positions taken because of opposition to supporting gang rather than individuals. So, so the reason that Hank was supported was because um, uh, the people who read uh, Hank's post knew he was being attacked by a feminist. 
That's what happened. And then the, the, the Hank Alex uh, Adria case is one battleground between feminists and 4chan that is already strongly established. I mean, feminists are, are, are a big target of 4chan people who are heavily related to the group at this PyCon conference that, um, that was being talked about. <coughs> now, I wanted just to mention something else that's in the spectrum of vigilantism but isn't quite in the same league as what we're talking about. Um, if you click on this link when you get the slides, you'll see that there's a way that there's a way of uh, loading software that enables you to hack sites that use terms you disapprove of. So whenever people are using political correctness, the term political correctness as a term of abuse, it is possible to get those sites turned into uh, other wording. And Instead of political correctness, treating people with respect is substituted. The word treating with people with respect is substituted wherever political correctness is being used on right-wing sites. And this, um, uh, the availability of this software was being uh, advertised on this guy's Twitter feed so people could go to him and get this software and uh, deface other sites they want uh, of, of people they disagreed with. Well, if you take the this Twitter link uh, together with its the use of the software, you get a kind of vigilantism. Are you with me? Now here are the issues that I, I think are interesting if you were gonna do a, a, a treatment of vigilantism. One is what was previously mentioned by Ian as a case of uh, West Coast fundamentalism. Um, digital space is supposed by people on the west coast of the United States to be the big unregulated space. Um, the digital space is also irreverent space. This is connected with its 4chan roots, which is kind of irreverence of, on a gross, of a gross kind. And then digital space and nerd dislikes, the, 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 peop, the sort of engineering constituency which takes itself to be custodians of the internet their values are kind of default values of West Coast fundamentalism. And then there's the digital space as a medium for identity wars where people who belong to solidarity groups uh, represented by blogs get into wars with one another with their support groups, with their gangs. So the qu if you were doing a good treatment of this, <coughs> you'd need to look at some of the political philosophy issues that can, are connected up with this as a space with the West Coast conception of the space versus other people's conception of a political space. Um, now, here are some claims that I would be willing to make uh, about, about vigilantism just to, to, to get it going, and I, I, I'm almost there. The, the more serious and uncontroversial the wrongdoing, the more justified punishing exposure is. So if a, if a piece of wrongdoing is, you know, verges on, on gross injury or murder or something like that, the less, that, the less constraints there are, the fewer constraints there are on punishing exposure. Punishing exposure should be with knowledge of local authorities um, because one doesn't want to have a completely lawless space yeah, contrary to West Coast yeah. fundamentalism. Yeah, and agents of punishing exposure should go public. They should say what they want to say in proprio persona, like uh, people in ordinary public that's a norm that I would want to argue for, that it's wrong for them not to go public. And then I should say targets of punishing exposure should be protected from physical harm, but prosecuted where they've broken the law, so that the cat in the bin woman uh, is uh, correctly treated. So if you were doing a complete theory of this, you'd need a whole lot more cases, but some of these generalizations, which would need to be argued for from foundations in theory, uh, could still be made. I, I hypothesize. That's all. <clears throat>